On this episode of Young Wild, Lincoln only has a couple days left in Alberta to harvest a bighorn sheep. And back in Oklahoma, Lincoln finds an opportunity to draw on one of the largest bucks in state history. Every great hunter was once a curious child who dreamed of a great adventure, a journey into the wild. Bugle and dodge. <laughs> you need to get your horn hooked up as a bugle. <laughs> We're doing some glassing this morning on a different mountain since we kind of screwed up the pattern of the rams that we were after yesterday. We got pretty close. It's amazing what these outfitters go through to get us in a position to hunt these animals. There's horses, breakfast, feeding the horses, saddling the horses. Uh, it's quite a chore, man. This is a pretty big operation. And what is what is that? My dad's smirk when you play. He's doing this. When he's messing with you, your dad has a smirk? Yes. I mean, you know. See, he's doing it right now. You see it? Jeez. This is a smirk? Yes, it's really good. I'll you Hey, he's even doing the smirk when he wrestles with you. Give him the horse poop. You're scaring the horse. Your mouth is like a barn door. You just can't keep it shut. You say I'm wrong no matter what I say. All you do is run me down. They have summited a mountain about 11 miles from where they spooked a group of rams. This is one of the best glassing spots in the entire unit. After several hours of glassing, not even a single sheep is spotted. Lincoln is beginning to realize the gravity of the missed opportunity on day one. No one can predict how the story will unfold on a fair chase hunt. But at least two facts will remain forever true. The ride down is always faster than the ride up. And Jake Franklin will never star in a Hollywood Western. Civil Wear Service Corporation is a proud sponsor of Young Wild.
coming to the end of our hunt and uh, the odds are getting lower as the days go by. Uh, but all we can do is look and that's what we're doing. We're putting in the time on the horses and we're putting in the time glassing and we'll see what happens. Finding the bighorn is not the issue in this particular area. We're seeing lots and lots of numbers. The key to this hunt is finding legal rams to pursue. All the rams we're seeing even this morning are not quite legal. They go back down, come up to the trees. Well, one of the hardest animals to get in North America, if not the world, is the bighorn sheep, especially with a bow and arrow. This is the Everest of hunting. Bighorn hunters, some of them chase these animals for years and years and are never successful. That's the biggest challenge with bow hunting is time. You need a lot of time. A lot of people, it's a lifetime challenge just to kill one sheep. At age 13, Lincoln has the rest of his life to look forward to. But as it relates to this hunt, his time has run out. They spent the rest of the day glassing, but they never saw another legal ram. In the morning, they'll bid the mighty Yaha Tinda farewell. I think Lincoln's attitude surprises me most when it doesn't work and when it doesn't happen the way he wants it. He goes, well, guys, it is what it is. You know, we gave it our all, right? Looks at Jim, his dad, and he's like, good job, bud, you did your best. And they're content with that. It's pretty cool seeing a 13-year-old realize that. This marks the second hunt of Lincoln's season without a harvest. Another reminder of how challenging it is to fair chase hunt all of North America's 29 big game species. Still ahead on Young Wild, Lincoln comes face to face with a buck that has haunted his dreams for over three years. No matter how many great places I go and how many amazing animals I hunt, I'll always come back and I'll always love to hunt the white-tailed deer. And they're such a smart and challenging animal to hunt, especially with a bow. Only a few days after returning from the bighorn hunt in Alberta, Lincoln finds himself with an opportunity to draw on what would be one of the biggest non-typical bucks ever harvested in the state of Oklahoma. For Lincoln, this is no ordinary encounter. In fact, this moment is the pinnacle of a story three years in the making.
2011 marked the beginning of Lincoln's hunting career. After years of practice and shadowing his dad, at the age of 10, he was finally able to pull 40 pounds. And he didn't waste any time getting in the stand. pulling his poundage and with the type of bow he was shooting. By the time the arrow got there, the deer had moved significantly, but, but he hit it, and uh, I was able to recover it for him while he was at school the next morning. After that, I was just totally hooked. He kind of went on a rampage there, you know? We had trouble getting on deer at first, then he was just kind of in the zone. Fall of 2012 when I was hunting with my sister, this is when it all happened. We actually didn't see any deer in range for her to harvest, but what we did see was this real narrow, super tall eight point. I mean, just a beautiful buck. I think every deer hunter dreams of finding that huge buck that just consumes their thoughts and consumes their hunting for that year. He becomes a part of our dreams. We're always saying, did you see that big eight? Did you see that big eight? Of course, we never saw him again. There's just so many thoughts that run through your head when you have a big buck like that in the woods. It just kills you to not see him again. So, fast forward a year, I was checking my trail cameras just like usual. <laughs> and I was shocked by what I saw. We pick him up at midnight on a trail camera and there's two pictures. Now the camera's there year round and there's multiple cameras on this place. But somehow all these other bucks, all these other doe are on these cameras and he somehow is able to live on this particular farm without us ever seeing. And that's what fascinates us about the white-tailed deer. And again, I didn't see him for the whole year. So that's two years in a row I've seen this buck, but only once and then he disappears. One year later, we're in the Yukon Territory. He and I are all over North America doing his hunts, and this big eight, for some reason, has decided he wants to be a movie star. He's on every camera, every time we check it. My Uncle Bob planted a food plot in a new area that we had never hunted before. Hey, what's up, man? I'm sitting here on the mountain beside my caribou right now. Hey, did you check the cam? Seriously? He's back in the daylight? Nice, dude. It's haunting Lincoln and I because we're thinking, man, we gotta get home to where he can have an opportunity to hunt this deer. Fall 2014 season starts and the buck gets really inconsistent with his patterns. Um, he starts coming in at different times of the day. Uh, he's real hard to predict. And there was one other buck that he really liked to hang out with. He was just a typical mainframe eight pointer. Really nice buck, probably a 125 inch buck. It's when you know you've made it, right here. When they put your name on a harness, they call me the tree spider. <laughs> what are you laughing at? So many things that I don't even know about you. Uh -huh. We get out there and the wind is really swirly. So I said, Dad, we got hogs over another camera. Maybe we want to just go have some fun tonight. And he said, no, we're already here. It's almost dark, let's just sit. It ended up getting real still right at dark and the wind finally switched into our favor and the deer started filtering into the food plot.
I was going to be totally content to shoot this eight pointer and he came in right on the trail that I thought he was going to come in on, but he never gave me an opportunity coming in. So he's sitting there and he's feeding and all of a sudden I look up and there is the monster buck right where the eight point came from. Biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. He's beautiful. That's a Pope and young deer. Thank you, Lord. I'm still shaking. So blessed. I'm so excited. We were nervous that we might not get him, that the odds were just too against us. This is definitely as big as it gets here in Oklahoma. Not only his horns, but his body is just massive compared to all the other deer. And I think I have an idea why. When he came in, he was just pushing all the other deer off the feed and taking it all for himself. Whew. We got him, Dad. This is awesome. Hi guys, I'm Piper Tapp, and this is Piper's Pantry, and today I'm gonna make a venison Salisbury steak. So what you'll need for venison Salisbury steak is of course the best part, venison backstrap. You're also gonna need coconut oil or any other oil you prefer, salt and pepper, one onion, Ritz crackers, garlic powder and onion salt, cornstarch, two beef bouillon cubes, two eggs, and these came straight from our chickens. Who's ready for some fresh eggs? So first we're gonna cube our meat. I'm cutting these with the Civil War striker thanks to Jeff Rowley. So we're gonna get a bowl and our eggs and I'm gonna go ahead and crack these into here. You're just gonna beat your eggs. Put these crackers into a baggie and crush them up that way. So I'm just gonna put these in a bowl and I'm gonna add my onion salt and my garlic powder. So you're gonna take one of your venison backstrap pieces and you're gonna roll it in some egg. Roll it around in the bread mixture, and there you have it. So when I'm cooking these, I tend to put the heat on medium-high heat. You can go ahead and start it if you're using any other kind of oil, but coconut oil heats up very fast, so I'm gonna go ahead and wait till I'm done with these. We got all of our pieces breaded, and I'm gonna rinse my hands off, and it'll be time to fry them up. Mm. 
I'm gonna start laying these in here. And you want them pretty close together so that you have plenty of room for all of them. So now I'm gonna start boiling my beef bouillon cubes. They're gonna cook for 15 minutes, but you want the steak to be nice and done. This is a wild game recipe that won't taste like wild game. Once you serve, you've got to boil it good.